Welcome to the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Centre podcast. The Cancer Research UK Cambridge Centre unites over 1,200 world-leading biologists, chemists, physicists, engineers, mathematicians, computer scientists, clinicians, nurses, and allied healthcare professionals from across Cambridge in the UK to tackle cancer from every angle. Our mission is to end death and disease caused by cancer through research, treatment and education. We are detecting cancer at its earliest stage and are developing personalised treatments for every patient through facilitating new collaborations and driving the translation of new scientific discoveries into clinical applications to improve patient care. By working together across a range of different disciplines, our members are breaking down the barriers between the laboratory and the clinic, enabling patients to benefit from the very latest innovations in cancer research. In this special episode of our podcast, I have with me Isabel Turbin from Edinburgh's Hospital in Cambridge, UK, and we're going to talk about the inherited pancreatic cancer and genetic testing. Isabel is one of the principal genetic counselors within the East Anglian Regional Genetics Service. She currently hosts cancer genetic, general genetic, and prenatal genetic clinics in Edinburgh's Hospital in Cambridge as well as a monthly general genetic clinic in Kinsling. She's also the education and training co-lead in the East Anglian Genetic Consulting team. Hi, Isabel. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, to start with, uh, could you please explain what genetic consulting is and what you do in each consulting session? Hi, uh, thanks for, for having me on the podcast today and thanks for the introduction. Um, and so, as you can sort of hear from the introduction, we don't just work within cancer genetics, but um, in the interest of this podcast, I'll just talk about the role of genetic counselling within cancer genetics. Um, so, part of our role as genetic counsellors is reviewing a person's medical and family history of cancer, um, and sometimes we may need to confirm more details about the cancer diagnoses in that person or their family members. And then we'll use all of this information to determine whether there's likely to be a hereditary cause for cancer in the family and whether any genetic testing will be indicated. And sometimes no testing is indicated, but we may still think that the individual or their family members are likely to be at a higher risk of certain a certain type of cancer compared to sort of individuals in the general population. And so if that's the case, we might may make recommendations about symptom awareness or we may suggest or refer people on for additional screening if that's available and if it's indicated for the particular cancer type or we may signpost them onto research studies if we think they'd be eligible. But if genetic testing is indicated, then we'd invite them for a clinic appointment to discuss the testing in more detail. And deciding whether or not to have a genetic test isn't always an easy decision. So we want to take the time to talk through what that test involves, uh, what it would look for, what the possible outcomes of that test are. Um, and then we'd also think about the possible implications for that person themselves. So whether the test could tell us about other cancer risks, whether there are options of how to manage those risks, and also how they might cope with the results of that test. Because if, if they're sort of going through their cancer treatment still, they may feel like they've got enough on their plate at the moment and that that's not the right time to have a genetic test. And that's perfectly fine. They can always come back and discuss it another time. Or they may actually listen to all of that information and say, I don't think I want to have this genetic test. And that's, that's absolutely fine as well. And I guess another important part of a genetic counselling appointment is to explore implications for family members as well. So thinking about how a gene alteration could be inherited and who in the family that might be relevant for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that can sometimes be quite a tricky conversation for someone to have. They, as I said, may still be in the middle of their own treatment or there may not be good relationships in a family or, or they may just not know how to start having that conversation with family members. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So part of our role is to help them think about how they might share information with family as well. So I guess ultimately our, our role as a genetic counsellor is to help people understand what the test is that they're being offered, all of the possible implications of that test, and really empowering them to make an informed decision about whether genetic testing is what's best for them at that particular time. Well, it sounds like a very like multifunctional role. So yeah, definitely yeah. a lot to it. And obviously there's then the side of it of if they do go ahead with the test and something is found, so if the genetic cause is found, then we'd want to support them with that result, help them to understand and adapt to that. And that could be the, the genetic, the medical, the psychological, or the familial implications of that result. Um, and making sure they're referred on for any other screening if, if there are other cancer risks indicated as well. So uh, you you keep mentioning about uh, genetic testing in, in answering the first question. So could you please explain uh, to our listeners what genetic testing is and uh, what types of genetic testing uh, there are? Yeah, good question. Um, so probably easier to start with a bit of background information about our genes. So they're like instructions um, which our body can read and follow to make all of the different parts of us. Um, so a bit like our blueprint, really. And we've got over 20,000 of these genes in our bodies. And they're in pretty much all of the cells of our bodies. And each of those genes has a different role or job to do. So they might determine pretty really benign things like eye colour. And others have important jobs like de- protecting us against certain types of cancer. And those genes themselves are made up of lots of chemical letters. So a bit like how we use our alphabet to write a sentence, genes have got their own chemical letters, which they make their sentences or the the genes with. And so just like we could get a spelling mistake in one of our sentences, genes can also have spelling mistakes in them. And you'll often hear these referred to as alterations or variants or mutations. And so to answer the first part of your question, a genetic test is essentially looking at our DNA or our genetic material And it's looking for alterations in genes, which will stop the gene from working properly or doing the job it's supposed to do. Um, And then the second part of your question was about the types of genetic tests. And so there can be different reasons for doing a genetic test, and that can determine what type of test is used. As I've said already, we don't just work in cancer genetics, but I'll answer these questions with um, cancer genetics in mind. I think that'll be easiest. So... One type of test is um, if, if someone has a known gene alteration in their family, say, for example, their mom is known to have an alteration in a particular gene, then predictive genetic testing would be available to them. And that would just look to see whether or not they've inherited a particular gene alteration that their mum, for example, is known to have. Whereas if someone has had a diagnosis of something, say a particular type of cancer, which is thought to possibly have a genetic cause, then diagnostic genetic testing would be offered to them to see if the genetic cause can be found. And so this type of test usually looks for alterations in multiple genes, which we call a panel of genes. And those two tests are usually carried out on a blood sample. So they look at someone's inherited DNA, which we also call the germline DNA. And that's the DNA or genetic material that we've inherited from our parents and is present in pretty much all of the cells of our body. And then we pass on about half of our germline DNA to our children and they'll get their other half from their other parent. But we do know that tumours can have their own genetic profile as well, so they can have their own genetic makeup. And so sometimes alterations can be present or appear in genes in the tumour DNA but not in the rest of the cells of the body. These alterations in just the tumour DNA are called somatic alterations. And I guess what's important is that these gene alterations can't be passed on to children and siblings or parents won't have them either. So then, uh, well, in terms of so many uh, testing out there, how and why the genetic testing can help for you know spotting the, the cancer risk and also for each kind of testing, what samples are required for these? Yeah, that leads on nicely from what we were just discussing. In terms of samples, genetic testing is usually carried out on a blood sample. So it looks at the inherited DNA 
but in cancer genetics sometimes the testing is carried out on tumor tissue so that we can look at the genetic profile of the tumor dna um, or sometimes it's both the blood sample and the tumor tissue being tested at the same time in terms of, sort of how and why it can help if a genetic cause is found for someone's cancer diagnosis then and that could be a germline or a somatic cause that could give us information about sort of what's driving the tumor growth and that can sometimes have implications for treatment of the tumor or cancer it might tell us when the tumor is likely to be sensitive to certain chemotherapy drugs or whether other treatments may be more effective and then if a genetic cause is found and it's a, an inherited or a germline genetic cause for someone's cancer then it could also tell us about other cancers they may be at increased risk of, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, and that could enable them to take steps to manage those increased risks. And that's one set of people we see, so that's the people that have a diagnosis of cancer. But then there's also the people who haven't had a cancer themselves, but there's that known gene alteration in the family that increases the risk of certain types of cancer. And so if they, they chose to have a test, that would give them information about their own cancer risks. And again, they could take steps to manage any increased risks. Then there are also options around family planning, which can prevent alteration being passed on to the next generation, mm -hmm. which some people choose to look into. I don't know if that makes it all sound a bit straightforward, but deciding, as I said before, so deciding to have a genetic test isn't always an easy decision. Mm -hmm. And so that's why genetic counselling is there to, to really encourage people to spend time thinking about the option of testing and all of those possible outcomes and implications. So in terms of these genetic testing, uh, what's available currently for specifically pancreatic cancer? Yeah, that's a, a hard one to answer, um, partly because our knowledge is changing all the time. Um, so the genes that are included on our tests are often updated, but also, it is a bit dependent on the type of pancreatic cancer that someone, someone's been diagnosed with, um, as well as the age that they were diagnosed, and sometimes also if they have any family history of cancer. Um, so genetic testing in England is specified by the National Genomic Test Directory. That sets out the different tests that are available, which genes are included on each panel, and what criteria someone has to meet to be eligible for the testing um, and we can provide a, a link in the podcast description for that test directory if anyone's interested um, but without going into all of the specifics and naming all of the individual genes because um, we may be here a while um, some people with a, a pancreatic adenocarcinoma would be offered testing for what we call the inherited pancreatic cancer gene panel and that currently has four genes on it. So that's the BRCA1, the BRCA2, the PALB2, and the CDKN2A gene. Pancreatic cancer has also has a strong family history of breast cancer or, or and or ovarian cancer. Then they may be offered testing of a panel of genes linked to those cancer types as well. And then if someone with pancreatic cancer had a strong family history of bowel cancer or of gynecological cancers, then some investigations for a genetic condition called Lynch syndrome may be indicated, although those in investigations are usually carried out on the tumour tissue first. So I guess the conclusion from all of that is that it's not necessarily straightforward. The oncology team may arrange genetic testing directly, or they may refer someone onto genetics, or if someone wants to know if genetic testing is available to them, they can ask to be referred to their local genetic service. Uh, so you've mentioned that for pancreatic cancer, currently in these panels, there are four genes involved. So what are the functions of these genes and uh, why do pathogenic variants of these genes could cause increased risk of pancreatic cancer? Yeah, so it's certainly there's those four genes on the pancreatic panel and the, there are other genes linked to that. Lynch syndrome condition that I mentioned as well and all of those genes tend to have roles in cellular processes like DNA repair so correcting errors that happen during DNA replication for example or regulating the cell cycle and um, so 
these genes tend to function as what we call tumor suppressors, which means they keep cells from growing and dividing too rapidly or in an uncontrolled way, which essentially means they're important for protecting our genome and our genetic material. And so they usually protect us from certain types of cancer. But if someone has an alteration in one of these genes, the gene doesn't work as it's supposed to. And so it's not protecting us as much as it should be. And that unrepaired DNA damage can build up, which ultimately leads to unregulated cell growth or a tumor or cancer developing. It's not well understood why alterations in the genes only increase the risk of certain types of cancer. There are different theories that I won't go into today, but the cancer risks that we give for people who have alterations in these different genes are based on big studies that look at thousands and thousands of people with alterations in these genes and then following them to see what types of cancer they develop. Uh, you've been talking about based on some very like, uh, large-scale studies so that uh, we concluded that these genes would be more relevant in such a type of cancer. So uh, could you provide some more information for how common are these pathogenic variants in these genes? For example, uh, you mentioned PAP2. And also uh, maybe you have already touched a little bit, like uh, how these or are there any variants of these genes would link to other cancer types? Yeah, both really good questions. So they're, they're not really common to have changes in these genes, but not completely unheard of either. So with the, the PALB2 gene you just mentioned, we think around one in about 770 people in the general population have an alteration in that PALB2 gene. The other genes people are often aware of are the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, and around one in 400 people in the general population have an alteration in one of those two genes. And then I talked a little bit about Lynch syndrome, and that can be caused by alterations in four different genes. And we think perhaps around one in three to 400 people in England have an alteration in one of those four genes. I'm not sure on the numbers for CDKN2A, um, but it is thought that around 3% of people with pancreatic cancer have an alteration in the CDKN2A gene. And so I've talked a little bit about the chances of people in the general population having alterations in these genes. Um, and we do know that in some particular groups of people, the um, alterations in these genes can be slightly more common. So just and as, as an example, we know that people in the Ashkenazi Jewish community can have a higher chance of having alterations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. And then to answer your second question, Yes, pathogenic variants in these genes can be linked to increased risks of other cancer types. Um, it's partly why that conversation before somebody has a genetic test is so important because we want them to be aware that that's the case before they decide to have a genetic test. I won't go into detail for all the genes individually, but we know that alterations in some of the genes can also increase the risk of cancers like breast cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, melanoma, um, bowel cancer, and endometrial cancer. And there are often ways that people can manage these increased risks of cancer, um, and that could be through additional screening and surveillance, or sometimes risk-reducing surgery. Uh, you talk about like different group of people might have these varied frequency of these gene variants. So... Are males more genetically predisposed than females uh, to pancreatic cancer because of these changes? So we know that pancreatic cancer is slightly more common in men than women. Um, so in the UK, about 48% of pancreatic cancer cases are in females and 52% are in males. And so that translates to about 1 in 57 UK females and one in 53 UK males being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in their lifetime. But in terms of genetic predisposition, both males and females have an equal chance of having an alteration in one of the genes that we've, we've mentioned. 
Um, and also when we think about the inheritance of these gene alterations in families, both males and females in a family have an equal chance of having inherited the gene alteration. And that's because both males and females have two copies of all of the genes we're thinking about here. Mm-hmm. And an alteration in just one of the two copies of the gene is enough to cause the increased risks of the particular types of cancer. So if someone is known to have a gene alteration, there's a 50% or a one in two chance that this has been passed on to their children, regardless of whether their children are genetic male or genetic female. The pancreatic cancer itself by nature may cause only very vague unexplained symptoms. So how can those who may be genetically predisposed, for example, like they have family members of individuals who have been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, um, to stay on top of early detection or early warning signs and advocate for themselves to have all necessary testing done? Yeah, it's a question we get asked a lot by patients. There isn't any clinical screening that we recommend to individuals who have a gene alteration, which increases their risk of pancreatic cancer. And that's because at the moment there isn't any clinical screening that's proven effective enough to pick up a pancreatic cancer at an early enough stage to improve prognosis. But we do recommend individuals with an inherited risk of pancreatic cancer remain symptom aware and that they have a low threshold for reporting any symptoms of concern to their GP. Um, We'd certainly recommend if they were worried about family history that they could seek genetics advice, so asking their GP to refer them to genetics. And also if they do have a known alteration in the gene that increases their pancreatic cancer risk. We we recommend they remind their GP of that if, if they are experiencing symptoms, because that can sometimes mean that things are expedited a bit, so investigations happen a little bit quicker. Although, having said that, there is an ongoing research project called Europac, and one of the arms of the study is looking at familial pancreatic cancer. So the study is trying to understand what effect a family history of pancreatic cancer has on someone's lifetime risk of developing pancreatic cancer themselves. And so the study usually uh, use of family and personal history questionnaires to assess a person's lifetime risk. And they do then offer screening if the person's risk is felt to be higher than that of the general population. And so the, the eligibility criteria for that research study can be found on their website, which again, I think we can include the details in the, in the podcast the description. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. And I think Europac are about to release an app as well. So that might be a good way of accessing their information. Yeah, that would be like quite handy for like now people, everyone has their yeah, mobile phone with them. The exactly. Yeah, I'm sure that's why they've done it. And I think that you also have already touched a bit, like, for example, in, in general, in the UK, whoever uh, knows that their family member has a gene alteration, they can go to the GP for referral. So uh, is there any, uh, you know, uh, age limit in terms of these predicting genetic testing can be offered? Yeah, that's a, a good question about age. And so for the genes that we think about with pancreatic cancer risk, alterations in these genes don't usually cause increased cancer risks during childhood. And so testing is typically offered from age 18 onwards. Um, That sort of allows that individual to, well, be deemed an adult at that point. And so they can make their own decision about whether or not to have the genetic test. I mean, it's just a touch on the GP referrals as well. Um, so GPs should know what somebody's local genetic service is. And so you would be referred to the, the genetic service most locally to you. But often what, what we do in our service is if somebody is found to have a gene alteration, we would provide them with what we call open letters or family letters, which briefly explain what's been found in the family. And it has our family reference number on. And then they can give that letter to family members who can take it to their GP and that can help them access a referral. So uh, can you please suggest uh, uh, where can our listeners find more information about genetic testing 
or ask for help? Yeah, so the Genetic Alliance UK website has uh, information about all of the NHS genetic services in the UK. It uh, also has useful pages about making the decision to have predictive testing and things like that. So that can be a good place to start. The uh, NHS webpage about genetic and genomic testing also has some good information and um, has some links out to other resources as well. And then most clinical genetic services in the UK will have their own website. So have a look for your local services website. We can put a link to the, the CUH clinical genetic webpage in the description as well. But yeah, there's usually information on your sort of local genetic service website too. And now comes to our last question. So um, how do you think the genetic testing will change the future healthcare of pancreatic cancer? That's a big question. Um, I I think what would be great is if, if we can find an effective way of screening individuals at increased risk of pancreatic cancer, then if a genetic test showed that someone has inherited the gene alteration, which is known to increase pancreatic cancer risk, they could then access that screening with the hope that if anything were to develop, it would be picked up early and that could improve treatment and prognosis. Um, so I don't think we're anywhere near the point of just blanket testing the whole population to see if they have alterations in the genes we've mentioned. Um, partly because the results of that testing in unaffected people are much more complicated to analyze and interpret. But also because there isn't currently any clinical screening that we could offer to those people if they were shown to be at increased risk. Um, probably in the nearer future, I think genetic testing for people who already have a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer will open the doors to more targeted therapies and treatments. Um, or perhaps to clinical trials that are looking at novel treatments. And who knows, one day we may be able to use medicines to reduce pancreatic cancer risk in, in individuals with an increased genetic risk. Um, but we might be a little way off from that. Okay, thank you very much for such informative conversation today. Um, thank you yeah. for having me. <laughs> yeah, uh, for this information, for sure, that would be very helpful for our audience not only looking for help, but also uh, knows who will help them to make the best decision for themselves. Thanks again for joining me today. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast. Don't forget that if you have a question that you would like us to answer in a future podcast episode, or if you have any ideas for topics that you would like us to discuss in a future series, Please let us know by visiting our website at www.crukcambridgecenter.org.uk slash podcast. See you in the next episode.